welcome to this wonderful episode of Destination Linux number 224. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. My name is Jill, and with me today are Michael, Ryan, and Noah. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so we have an exciting episode lined up for you. On this week's episode, we are going to talk with Neil Gompa, a DevOps engineer by day, Linux systems aficionado and developer by night, about the Fedora 34 KDE edition release. Then we'll check out Caden Live 21.04. Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. And all this coming up right now on Destination Linux. So keep your penguins marching. Yay! Yeah. So for those who watched us live on Sunday, we covered a topic about the University of Minnesota being banned. New info has come to light, so we're doing a live kernel patch to this portion of the show <laughs> to include that in the new information. So in our community feedback, we're heading to the DLN forum, dlnforum.com, where the community is discussing a post from uh, Ethanol about the recent banning of the University of Minnesota contrib from contributing to the kernel. It's a complex story, but to summarize what took place, a graduate student and their professor at the University of Minnesota working on a paper entitled On the Feasibility and Stealthily Introducing Vulnerabilities in Open Source Software via Hypocrite Commits tried to put the use after free or UAF vulnerability into the Linux kernel. Their actions were noticed, and as you might expect, the kernel developers were not happy about having to waste their time reverting no bad kidding. patches. And, and you know, of course, I mean, you... I was shocked just as much as you were. And re reviewing other patches rather than spending time working to improve the kernel itself. So uh, a lot of people believe the ban was justified, and other people argue that is a gray area of sorts. Some claim that if they were informed, then that would skew the results. So maybe they were simply testing the security vulnerabilities and that sort of stuff with no real harm done being threatened. So let's discuss this. What do we think about the University of Minnesota banning is it justified? Is it overcorrection? Is it overreaction? What do you think? Well, for me, I've got to look at the long list of actual bugs and security vulnerabilities that we know exist out there in the Linux kernel and any software, frankly, and think about how busy the kernel developers are out there. So anytime you're playing games like this from a trusted source, whether that be the students individually or whatnot from that university, they probably have a long history, I would assume, of submitting actual patches, and that creates some trust. And therefore, you may not have to review those typically as hard as you may review somebody who's contributing to the kernel for the first time. So I feel like this is a breach of trust. And I feel like in those discussions that I was able to read that I had purview to, that if the developers themselves, like Hartman, decided that at the end of this, there was enough issues that they wanted to ban them until they take some additional steps to correct some of their actions and activity, then that's justified. Because this is a very important thing that runs tens of thousands of servers and everything else behind the scenes that somebody's just kind of playing with for the sake to see if they could sneak things in. And if the whole question is, can we get be able to sneak things into a Linux kernel or an open source software, I, I think the answer is, well, of course, there's that possibility. It's going to be found and it'll get fixed and corrected pretty quickly when it gets in there. But I, don't, I think it's pretty obvious that that stuff could happen and has happened in the past, just like with closed source software, for instance. It's taking yeah. place. I think your point about the whole trust factor of the University of Minnesota already, you know, kind of been spending years submitting to the to the to kernel and that might kind of using that as a way to uh, do the testing and have a trust factor kind of does a little bit muddy the waters of the research in, in a way too so it's a it's an interesting point there uh, Jill what do you think yeah so you know I definitely agree with Greg Crow Hartman that the Linux kernel is no place to be experimenting with bugs that's absolutely true whether they're considered ethical or not, you don't do that in the creation process of you know, the, the Linux kernel. And it's okay to experiment on your own install of Linux on your own computer, which is ethical hacking, but not, you know, again, not during you know, the process of the Linux kernel and, and its uh, creation. Inserting bugs is not a good thing. <laughs> 
And um, we've got some more recent information. And it got me thinking, because uh, this is, you know, an ever-changing story. And it got me thinking, um, one of the big takeaways and lessons learned is that there is a need for a more balanced approach between the speed of the kernel progress with that of serious patch review and low number of bugs overall. You know, there's not enough people to review all these patches. So that's that's something that maybe we can think about more and um, get more people involved to review these patches. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think there's a yeah. the, the fact about... It does kind of show there is a somewhat of an issue. Like there's the the trust factor that's a part of it, but also maybe there is a, a thing about like just not having enough, uh, you know, developer power to uh, to address those things. But uh, it, it, the the thing about the kernel is that it is heavily based on trust. So with the mm -hmm. establishment of the university already having that for so long, I think that it kind of it, it made an interesting. Uh, situation, uh, you know, pr definitely problematic from the perspective of the developers and that sort of stuff, because it's not, it's not that just the code was submitted and it was problematic code or bug code or stuff like that, but also because they didn't inform anyone. So they didn't yeah. contact Linus Torvalds. They didn't contact Greg KH or, or uh, anyone else really. So they did this, uh, you know, under the guise of, of of security and testing things, which is good, but the idea of finding holes that need to be patched, if the people who would need to patch it aren't aware you're testing it, they're not going to see the holes until you've mm -hmm. already like established them. So that way they could quickly address it if they were actually paying attention or participating. So if they were to have gone to Craig KH or Linus Torvalds, I don't think they would have to go to anybody else. They could just have one of those two people uh, approve of it and see if it you know maybe it would have been valuable in that sense to do that uh but the way that they I don't know that though weird when, we, when we talk about people I don't know that throwing I mean it's always of course if more people could get involved sure the better uh, I would love that but you're talking about a kernel that's what 27.8 million lines of code mm -hmm. so yeah. it, it <laughs> is a heavily even if, there's not enough people you could throw at it to review every single facet and even if they reviewed that code specifically exactly doesn't right. mean that the person writing it wouldn't be sneaky enough to where you would just, or you're tired that day and you're looking at them. I and I've done that with code before, but things look fine in the code. Looks great. I approve it. It goes through and Oh, it's buggy. Mm -hmm. it, it happens. Like there's no, there's no superpower here that a programmer can automatically detect anytime there's a vulnerability written within the code that they review. So even if somebody did review it, it could still get through, which is why I trust I feel like is a big part of the kernel yeah. development. Yep. That trust being broken is the, the huge issue here. Um, I think it's interesting to kind of want to do some tests and things, but you should at least be informing Michael, to your point, somebody there, if you want, if you want to do that and uh, be able to kind of run that gray hat hacker type theme, but without having to actually, you know, use unnecessary amount of work for the developers to go back and fix this mess that's kind of been created here. Yeah, for sure. And I, that is, that's a great point. I, I just wanted to bring up one more thing that they did uh, apologize for the actions. So they, uh, you know, they did acknowledge that it was a mistake and how they went about it. So, um, you know, hopefully they can uh, make adjustments in how they do the processing. And the University of Minnesota did respond saying that they did not uh, like the, the some of the parts of the department heads were not aware of this happening, uh, and the uh, institutional review board was not aware of it happening when it happened. They were asked for permission after the fact. Like the request said something about like we recently finished a research paper, and then asked for permission to do the research paper, and it was kind of you know weird. Uh, but you know I think they. Or, you know, they learned that they realized that it was a mistake after the facts, but at the same time, the damage has been done. So there is going to be something that there is going to be something that has to be uh, addressed in certain ways. But it's nice to see that the kernel, uh, the kernel project did mention that there are ways that the university could, you know, get back the, the ability to do contributions and redeem themselves sort of stuff. Uh, they they showed they laid out uh, they sent an email laying out what the university needed to do uh, and some reports have uh, provided that out for public so it's an interesting uh, situation and uh, I think that it's overall uh, we're learning that sure you know the there could be a thing but the trust factor I think is that probably the biggest key like you mentioned Ryan and uh, I think that we all need to think about like yes you could put it in there but 
when you're already you? trusted. Right. You know, it would be like me or you or Jill trying to sneak something into the show notes. Like, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it. So I wouldn't, yeah. you know, I wouldn't even be looking for such a thing. And exactly. That's because over the years, you build that trust. And with that getting broken, you know, but I, I am glad that they are giving them a way back in. And obviously, University of Minnesota has probably done some great stuff with the Colonel in the past and things. And mm -hmm. hopefully this just kind of goes away. But that's what they're talking about on the DLN forum, which is why we wanted to bring it up today in the community feedback. But it's important to know this is an emerging story. We obviously already had to do a Colonel patch, as Michael called it, <laughs> earlier on this. Yeah. So the facts could change. We could find out other people were involved or weren't involved or maybe it wasn't such a big deal after all. But I think it's still an interesting story to think about being put in a place of trust and what you do with that, despite what all the other things that are going to unravel during this uh, story happen to be. Yeah. And if there's something you want to do that tests other people's involvement in their projects that could, could negatively impact them, you know, at least let them be aware of it to a degree. That's all. So, so I am not going, okay. Okay. So Ryan just gave a suggestion about <laughs> what could have happened. It's like an example of like, you could have put stuff in the show notes and then he just did that trying to get me to read I it. I did not. And I did you not. Wrote that. Uh, I'm not reading that. No. He tried it says, to, Michael, mm -hmm. I like Windows 10. Michael it, Reed, I like Windows 10. But I, why would I say, why would, one, I'm not going to I don't know how that got no. in the show notes. I would never it, break it our just, trust. It, it just happened. I, apparently okay. it just, it was just, it was just a My hypocrite bad. commit right there. <laughs> hypocrite commit. <laughs> Well, we love hearing from our worldwide community. What we want you to do is get your official DLN mug. Jill, can you show them what official DLN mug? Some yeah, people don't go. have one. I can't, can't believe be it. But some people in our community don't even have one of these mugs yet. It's <laughs> embarrassing. Please fix it and get yourself a mug. Fill it with some coffee or bubbly. These are the approved drinks from Destination Linux. Sit down <laughs> at your nearest stool, which is the official sitting uh, apparently object yep. of Destination Linux. Yep. And send us an email to comments at destinationlinux.org or... Put some interesting questions or news topics in the deal and forum, and they may make it on the show as well. This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean and their new app platform. DigitalOcean's app platform service is a solution to build modern cloud native apps. DigitalOcean's app platform has support for Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, and static sites. What does all that mean? Well, it simply means that you point your GitHub or GitLab repository to the app platform and let DigitalOcean do all the heavy lifting. Handle the infrastructures, app runtimes, dependencies. You concentrate on your code. Pushing it into production, just a few clicks, DigitalOcean handles the rest. Secure apps automatically because they're going to create, manage, your SSL certificates and protect you from your apps from DDoS attacks. You can run code with little to no customization and the app platform uses open cloud native standards and automatically analyzes your code, creates containers and runs them on Kubernetes cluster. Now, as a listener of the Destination Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for only 5,000, I'm sorry, free, free. It costs you nothing. <laughs> Actually, it's better than nothing because we're going to give you money to spend on DigitalOcean. How do we do that? Well, we give you a special site. You go to the special site. It te tells DigitalOcean that you listen to this podcast and that you appreciate what we do and that you appreciate what they do and they appreciate what we do. And they Anyway, you go to do.co slash DLN, do.co slash DLN. They give you $100 credits in Benjamin's not really Benjamin's. Actually, it's more of credit on their platform. But anyway, it's $100. And if you go to do.co slash deal and you get that $100 credit on DigitalOcean's app platform, and then you can start spinning up things and pointing your code to, or pointing their app platform to, to your GitHub repository, GitLab repository, and they can push all your stuff out into production and try it. And then if it works, which it will, because it always does, then you'll sign up and you'll become a customer. So don't throw your $100 in the trash. Go to do.co slash DLN. That's do.co slash DLN. And a huge thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. So this week, we're going to be discussing Fedora Linux 34 KDE edition with our friend and patron, Neil Gompa, who is a contributor and developer for Fedora. We interviewed Neil about his Linux journey on Destination Linux 198. So make sure to go check out this, this episode to learn more about Neil and his journey in Linux. So Neil, we are very excited to have you. And as we know, Fedora Linux 34 was officially released yeah. Tuesday, April 27th. So what's the reception of this release been like from a developer's point of view? I'd say that it's actually been really, really surprisingly positive with like a dash of excitement. 
<laughs> like a lot of people are super interested in, you know, the GNOME platform had been bumped up to 40 with the with the GNOME 40 release and and Plasma 521 and pipe wire introduction, some of the advancements we've done with ButterFS and like the general development stack rebases with Ruby 3.0, you know, newer uh newer rails and stuff like that. All the, all the various uh, different things that we do every cycle this time, I think just got a lot more attention because we did a lot more user facing stuff around that front. Awesome. Nice. So Fedora 34 workstation is an exciting release. You mentioned that they have GNOME 40 as, as it and, and all that stuff. And that's great, but you know, what's the most exciting thing for me. <laughs> it's uh, the KDE spin of Fedora. Oh, come on. Michael. And <laughs> I realize that pretty much no one is surprised that I'm asking about the KDE spin, but what people may not know is that Fedora KDE has been my daily driver for a little over six months now. So I've been watching pretty closely with Fedora 34 and there are a lot of changes in this release. And one of those changes that, you know, might be, Raise, raising the people's eyebrow. Uh, anybody? Any, no. Anyway, that being Wayland <laughs> by default in Fedora 34 KDE spin. So uh, tell us about this change and what can users expect from it? So this change, it was important that it was a public change, but in, in, in many ways, it's kind of supposed to be a change you don't really notice too much. The main goal around switching uh, the Plasma desktop to use Wayland by default really was to establish some leadership uh, around the KDE ecosystem to drive forward the the desktop to use Wayland instead of the X11 technology stack, because that's where a lot of the upcoming innovations coming from, like a lot of the refinement around new user interface peripherals, improvements around uh, things like digital pens, uh, multi-touch gestures, uh, like handling uh, mixed DPI, handling high DPI scaling, frame buffer scaling, or otherwise known as fractional scaling. A lot of the related, you know, niceties that I think people tend to expect on other platforms, you know, it's really difficult to do in X11. I mean, it's uh, anything is technically possible, but the idea of building all this in with a simpler graphics pipeline to make things more efficient and more effective means that hopefully if you've got the right hardware and you've got everything going well, you won't notice anything other than a smoother, more responsive desktop experience and maybe just slightly bit less resource uh, usage for your desktop because with the Wayland environment, you are now running fully composited. Everything is being rendered through the GPU. And these days, you can't really get a computer without a decently powerful uh, GPU that can at least render a desktop environment and you know do some nice little special effects and whatnot to make the experience just that bet a little bit better. And, you know, with X11, this means that a lot of that gets offloaded back to the CPU and has to go back to the classic rendering path. And because no graphics card in the last decade actually has a 2D acceleration pipeline, all of that stuff that happens in X actually is rendered on the CPU, which, and then means that it goes to system memory and all of that has to be copied back and forth. And it's just really expensive and inefficient. So hopefully you don't actually see much, but what you do see is a cleaner, crisper experience. Yeah, no, that's well said. Yeah, that's and, awesome. and it, mm -hmm. I think the interesting thing with Wayland is when, like what you said, the moment that you're booting into Fedora, you've just installed it and you just get to work and you don't notice anything, Wayland success for the desktop environment, right? <laughs> that the key is you don't notice that you're even in a Wayland session. In terms of the way that, that you talk about the graphics pipeline and it being a lot more cohesive and that sort of stuff, it does seem to be somewhat smoother. The, the times I've used Wayland and it uh, and it be like all the right hardware and all the stuff is set up, it is an, a lot smoother in certain aspects. And the lack of screen tearing is That's wonderful. That's nice, isn't it? Yeah. It is my personal pet peeve. I absolutely mm -hmm. hate screen tearing. <laughs> At work, I have a three display system. And if I'm watching videos or whatnot, like... You know, as I said earlier, like it's because there's no 2D acceleration pipeline on any graphics card anymore. All that goes back to the CPU. But the video is always rendered on the GPU because of the way that video codec hardware acceleration works. So you're copying buffers back and forth between or basically video frames. You're copying all that back and forth between the CPU and the GPU and it going through the display and all that stuff. And that's what leads to. Um, lack of synchronization, you'll see you'll see it perceived in the form of like uh, video and audio synchronization issues, lag, all these kinds of like 
weird niggly things that people just kind of don't, they internalize and think, oh, this is just kind of glitchy. This is just kind of bad. In, a, in the Wayland graphics pipeline, when everything is working as it's supposed to, because you're using a graphics card where you have everything composited properly and it's rendering offsite onto the GPU for all of it, and it's using the VRAM on the GPU to actually access everything and, and process it and push it out to the display, that doesn't happen. And that that is incredibly important for reaching the highest quality desktop user experience. Because without that, like you're just always going to have these little imperfections and little, you know things that just irritate people depending on what they pay attention to for their desktop experience. So Neil, one more thing on this. Uh, there was a situation we were actually, me and you were working on this little bit. Well, it was mostly me just telling you about it uh, on from the last mostly episode. You working on it, yeah. <laughs> I was in Wayland and I had an NVIDIA card and I couldn't get OBS to open it. Basically said you don't have the right graphics drivers. There is a fix for that in place for people who want to use OBS in Wayland when NVIDIA launches their new driver release, correct? Yeah. So um, something that I, I, I made a point to make sure to have ready is that with Fedora Linux 34, um, if, you're, if you're installing OBS Studio from RPM Fusion, so uh, I, I don't know too much about what's going on with the flat pack or any of the other methods to get it, but if you're getting it from RPM Fusion, which is the well-known third-party repository for stuff that Fedora itself cannot ship, that has OBS Studio version 27 already available for you. And that is compiled with all the functionality to use Pipewire for screen sharing. Uh, it is set up to communicate with the Wayland, uh, is set up with Wayland bindings enabled, and it is able to do screencasting, recording, layering, all that stuff uh, with a Wayland session. I tested it myself on my Plasma Wayland setup on one of my laptops, and, in, and on another session with Gnome Wayland on another one, and it worked perfectly. Awesome. Nice. I can't wait to try it out. I've I didn't get to switch when it first when uh, Fedora first released yet, and I I've been and all week I've been like really I just want to try the new OBS and then want to try the Wayland setup and I want to try Pipewire and all these things and then like the the show comes and like all of a sudden out of nowhere the st the podcast comes and I have to record I'm like well I I got to use the system I already got but out of nowhere right where out of the, nowhere it's the okay. six days go Michael okay shh whatever but uh you know. That's how, that's how it works. That's how it works. Out of nowhere. The Fedora KDE spin is shipping Plasma 5.21. And with the brand new visual look, can you tell me a little bit about the decision to ship the Breeze Twilight theme by default? Yeah. So funny story about that. I actually had personally been running this way since about late 2015. And I didn't really have a name for it. And I just kind of always went with it because something that I had noticed very early on is that I prefer a dark theme for everything. Like I prefer a dark visual look for the applications, for the panels, for the whole thing. But I also noticed that uh, GTK applications don't like it when you are in dark mode for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. one of the things that I kind of hacked way back then was this idea of the application decorations and the windows and all that stuff, that remains in Breeze light. Then the panels would be in Breeze dark. And the advantage of that was GTK, which doesn't actually know too much. Uh, this may have improved since, but like when I was working with this, it didn't know too much about how to handle transitioning between light to dark on a plasma desktop. And it would get things like icons wrong, font text setup wrong. Like Firefox was a terrible offender of this. Like Firefox just did not handle being in dark mode very well uh, on my desktop. And this is actually true on all the platforms, like not just on Linux. So because of that experience, I was like, all right, if I do it this way, then the applications look okay. Chrome renders fine. Firefox renders fine. Other GTK applications that are preloaded on Fedora look fine. Uh, and then cute applications look fine as well. And then the panels are dark. And the side effect is the desktop kind of just fades into the background. And you just, it's a lot easier for you to focus on the tasks that you're working at hand. And so to me, it felt like, oh, wow, this is, this is nice. And then I was talking to some other folks in the KDE project upstream. And when I said that I was interested in like changing this to be the default, uh, someone else uh, in there, I believe um, Dominic Hayes from the Farron OS project, uh, he took up the mantle of actually like preparing the changes for it. Cause I didn't understand how plasma look and feel stuff worked. He, made it and then I named it Breeze Twilight. And so now we have this new deep, uh, this new available look and feel in, in Plasma 521. And I elected to change Fedora Breeze, which is what I informally call our 
basically Breeze with the fedora background. But that's basically all it is. I elected to change it so that it would have Breeze Twilight by default because I thought it was a great experience. It looked fantastic. And I think it, uh, it it's something that uh, our audience will tend to actually appreciate. So I went and switched it to that. And there we are. As a part of the audience, I do appreciate it. So I don't know if I can confirm for everyone, but... It is a much improved uh, display of the look and feel. I am a big fan of the Breeze Twilight thing. I I was when it, when they announced that KDE was going to get it, I was so excited to see that because uh, uh, Neil and I were talking uh, previously before. Also, it's the, your fault, Michael. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying it was my idea, but I have I I did kind of lean, uh, pushed Kubuntu into doing that. Well, I I politely asked them a hundred times, and <laughs> it was. Uh, and and they they did it a couple years ago. And when I saw that Fedora was interested in doing it, and that KDE would put put it built into the actual package, I was ecstatic. So it was I want this to be the default for KDE. So hopefully uh, somebody from the KDE is listening and he's going like, wait. Let's let's make it default. Like because that that would be fantastic. Just you know, quick note. That's his one hundred and first time asking them. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah, and Neil, I I absolutely love the new theming myself. The dark gray is a really nice. It, it just it contrasts perfectly with the pretty blue forest wallpaper and even the blue fedora logo for the menu. And it's just very visually clean and beautiful to to use right out of the box. I loved it. I'm <laughs> glad I'm not in. the only one who thinks that. I'm really happy <laughs> with how it came out in the end. Uh, and also, so we you you mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to go back to it. You talked about Pipewire. So another big change of 34 is Pipewire. Uh, and this we, we talked about this when it was announced that it was becoming default. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about it because can you briefly explain what Pipewire is for those who don't know what it is? And also, what can users expect to see by having Pipewire available by default in the configuration that it is? Yeah, sure. Um, so... I'm going to make the assumption that people don't know what Pulse Audio is either. So I'm going to explain in a very generic high-level way. So Pipewire is both a service and a framework for managing uh, multimedia resources on your system. So that includes audio and video. And in the case of what we did for, uh, for Fedora Linux 34, we changed it so we swapped out Pulse Audio, which was a sound server that managed audio resources to use Pipewire, which supports both audio and video resources, so that the audio resources are all being directed through Pipewire in a uniform fashion. This is combined with the efforts that we've done over the past few Fedora releases, where we've integrated Pipewire for screencasting, screen sharing, screenshots, all the other kinds of associated desktop video resources through the desktop portals. The Ma the ultimate result here is that by unifying these two layers and using the same pipeline throughout it, a desktop that is sufficiently aware is able to do things like screencasting with audio synced to the video it is sending because that is all being collected through the same pipeline. So it's all time coded, it's all uniform, it knows what's going on. But another important aspect is that um, the previous sound server solution, Pulse Audio, had explicitly avoided handling use cases that were common in prosumer usage of Linux, such as yes. doing low latency audio, real-time deterministic audio streaming, those kinds of things. Now, it did handle some of it over time because there were things done to try to make that better. But overall, that was just not something it was aimed to do. But a lot of people are increasingly starting to use Linux for prosumer use cases for both video and audio. And when you're Adding this with things like live streaming or live audio performances, band performances, things like that, you've got to have the ability to have deterministic audio sampling, a transmission, encoding, sequencing, the whole works. You've got to be able to mix and match sources. You've got to be able to move those things around. And those things in real time is very hard with the classical audio stack. Boy, calling it classical, I feel old because like I was <laughs> I remember when we switched to Pulse Audio. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and the big pain point that a lot of people have had when it came to these kinds of use cases was you had to set up a whole second audio server and get them to talk to each other. That audio server is often known is called Jack right. or the Jack Audio Connection Kit. And that system is notorious for being extremely difficult to configure to get it to talk correctly to all the other bits of the audio stack and to keep it working and to interface with it, like to the point 
that there are there are variants of Linux distributions, for example, Fedora Jam and Ubuntu Studio, that their entire purpose is to pre-configure Jack and set <laughs> it up so that you can actually do these things yep. when there is no appreciable reason for why you need to do that. So mm -hmm. the real advantage here is that by unifying these use cases into Pipewire and having all the audio go through it uh, and having desktop streaming already going through it as we've been doing for a while now, it is now possible for complex production use cases to be handled out of the box with minimal configuration. And that, that is the real goal here. Mm -hmm. This yeah, is very, awesome. very big. Mm -hmm. This is one of the, the biggest issues I have had. And over the years, if you've listened to this podcast, know with Linux, the thing that bugged me the most has been audio. And the interfaces that we use are prosumer, as you call them, interfaces. You can go buy at Guitar Center and those type of things, your Scarlet 2i2s, your Behringers, those things. And yes, there are some that are completely plug and play, but because I'm doing a lot of times playing audio through a video, recording it with OBS, maybe sometimes even doing all that live, what happens is these channels would cross and everyone listening and watching the show or the recording it sounds fine, but to me, I start hearing people sound like robots and all kinds of different things get thrown off. The fix for it initially was Jack, and I had someone come and do the whole setup for me. Mm. And I figured it all out, and I even had a script to install it because I was distro hopping, but maintaining it became completely impossible. So I eventually spent the time. It took me, I don't know, weeks probably of you know an hour here, an hour there, but figured out what settings in the daemon comp in Pulse Audio were causing this and created a script out there on my GitHub to fix it. But not having to deal with any of that anymore is essentially what you're selling now, right? With using Pipewire. And I upgraded the 34 20 minutes before this show started. That's how much faith I had in the Fedora Aww. community that they were going to get it right. And I'm in Pipewire right now, but I have no idea I'm in Pipewire. And I think that's mm -hmm. the win. Everything's working. Mm -hmm. All the audio's there, recording. Everybody can hear me, but I have no clue otherwise unless I read those release notes that I'm using Pipewire. I think it's amazing. I think it's awesome. And it's one of the biggest changes that for me has been huge. Now, if you're somebody who's used Pulse Audio for years and use regular headphones and speakers, you're probably not even going to notice any difference at all. But yeah. this is this is big for any of the professional Huge. prosumer audio people. I can't wait to play with all the different mix and matching and stuff and having like the, the stuff you can do with Jack, having that out of the box is like is mind blowing, basically. Like that that's one of the things that those other distros that do that sort of stuff that do special uh, development like you talked about. Uh, but having it in Pipewire just built into the design of the structure is just I'm so excited to play with it and to see what I can do with it, especially like you talk about the OBS uh, version that's in the 34. Uh, okay, I, I I couldn't do what Ryan did and do it 20 minutes before, but <laughs> I'm going to try my best to do it 20 minutes after. There you go, 20 minutes awesome. after. <laughs> so thank you, first of all, to all the developers of Pipewire. This has been huge. And thank you, Fedora, for pushing this innovation forward into the distro. So when we think about the innovation, we talked about Pipewire. We've talked about Wayland. We've talked about ButterFS and the capabilities it's going to have for Fedora in the future. You got a lot going on in the Fedora world, but your job as a developer is never done. You may take this breath right after this interview, but then we expect you to get right back to working <laughs> on Fedora 35. So what are some things we can expect in Fedora 35? Yeah, so that's... that's uh... <laughs> Oh, Ryan, you don't ask for halfsies, do you? Um, <laughs> so at least I'm personally, you know, I, I'm continuing to engage with the with the KD community to, you know, try to bring the feedback about what how, what's been going well, what has been going um, less well with the Plasma Wayland stuff to help help them improve the experience. Like I actually, I, I don't know if anyone saw it yet, but like uh, I think Nate Graham's like blog post about what's just happened for Wayland stuff. Some of those were related to things that we discovered during the development cycle, and they're all fixed for 5.22. So I'm I'm really excited for when 5.22 lands, and that's going to be brought in to uh, into Fedora, and it's going to be in the stable releases. So like we're going to release to Fedora Linux 34 uh, in June, shortly after we put it into Fedora Rawhide, which is you know going to become 35. Give it a little bit of soak time to make sure everything's all gravy, and then pull it back into 34. 
Um, on top of that, uh, one of the cool things that I'm personally excited about is that we're going to introduce a KD flavored version of an immutable desktop variant of Fedora called Fedora Kinoite or Kinoite Kinoite. Mm -hmm. uh, either way it works. I still haven't decided which one I like more, but uh, <laughs> this is Michael's fault. Michael's the one who discovered that there is actually another one. I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I looked it up on the translate tool, and it said that because it was like the and I thought it was the right one because I my in my head I go okay so silver blue th type thing for KDE is actually being powered by OS tree, and then Kanoate is Japanese for with trees. Like I just assumed that that was right. Turns out it wasn't, but now it, it's added confusion, which I think is great because it is fun to say it that way, you know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I'll mispronounce Fedora it forever, anyways. So just pick yeah. one. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you pick. <laughs> He's going to say some other thing that wasn't right. either one of the two options. Cody. It's Cody. Aww. Coyote. The the thing I am really excited about is introducing Fedora Kinoite, and Fedora Kinoite will be based on RPM OS tree. It'll work in if you're familiar with Fedora Silver Blue, which is a semi mutable variant of Fedora using RPM OS tree and all that stuff. Um, using flat packs for a lot of the applications and stuff like that. That's going to come with to the KDE side of things in Fedora with Fedora Kinoite. Another aspect of this is like, I want to kind of do a little bit more to improve our ARM64 support for KDE Plasma. So with Fedora yes. Linux 34, we introduced 64 bit ARM based images for things like Pinebook Pro, Raspberry Pi 4, and 400, and similar equipment. I want to make sure that we can get you know, some refinement on this and it's like, what pain points are we seeing with this uh, and and try to help improve the experience there. Um, and of course, since, you know, we've been talking, we've talked about ButterFS in the past and that, that's also a part of this release with the transparent compression being turned on. I'm also looking towards having more and more features where prudent uh, available and enabled by default snapshots. in Fedora. And mm -hmm. yes, as you, you, were, you mentioned snapshots, I want to make it, I want to come up with a way to make it super easy for someone to, open an application, click a toggle, and then have system snapshots turned on. I have not yet decided whether I want them on by default all the time, but I want to at least make it easy for someone to get that set up so that they could do it, you know, similar to like some other prominent operating systems where they have their automatic snapshotting and, and backup solution stuff. I want to have the ability for someone to build something like that on Fedora as well, because we have all the pieces to make that happen. It's yeah. just bringing it all together. One last thing. What about a GUI for Pipewire? Is there similar to Pulse Effects and that type of stuff? Is it, are you aware of any projects in the works around that? So this is what you're going to find really awesome and possibly <laughs> terrible, depending on your point of view. Okay. Pulse Effects as a 5.0 is Pipewire native, requires Pipewire. So it works through that. Ooh, uh, did not know that. All the Jack GUIs you're used to uh -huh. work straight out of the gate with Pipewire. Yep. Yeah, all so, of the Pulse so awesome. Audio GUIs that you are used to that work straight so out of the gate with cool. Pipewire. Do you see you our don't... patron chat there, Neil? All these woo, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, look at that. Q, uh, that's exactly. Q mean. Jack uh, Control, uh, Cadence, Carla, all those things. Just, yeah, they just work. Like, yeah. Oh wow, fantastic! They, those will all just work with Pipewire. That's incredible. Now, if somebody wants to make a dedicated Pipewire UI, I'm not going to say no. But all the things that you're used to from a, from a prosumer or even regular desktop user perspective will actually just work with Pipewire. Like personally for me, like the, the, the happiest moment I had was when we switched to Pipewire and I connected up my Bluetooth speaker. <laughs> I got for the first time ever, I got the high quality audio codec to work out of the box. I didn't have to do any fiddling. I didn't have to do any fiddangling. And it used LDAC right out of the gate. Mm. And the audio sounded great. It was low latency. And it and it was, I I cried tears of joy. Because like that, <laughs> because like it is so freaking hard to get Bluetooth to work correctly. And it worked just absolutely monumentally well. Like okay, way one better more thing than, than Neil, because you, you've blown my socks off. And you know, I can't <laughs> complain about that. So there, I, got, I had to come up with something. So here it is. Fedora 35, we know that other operating systems, as you mentioned them, we have Cortana, they have the built-in assistance, you have the Alexa and all of that. I spent a lot of time, as you know, writing the Michael AI bot, and I'm wondering if we could include that as the artificial intelligence for Fedora 35. Oh, no. <laughs> it's 166 lines of Python code, and I'm telling you, it's 
It's worth it. It went Aww. up to 66 lines of Python code. Wow, I thought it was only 100. You must have been doing some hard work to improve it. Yeah, uh, yeah. well, you know, developer's yeah. job never ends, Neil. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Um, if you want to, you know, if you want to package it up and add it to Fedora, then maybe uh-huh. we could talk about it, at, right, about including fantastic. it on something afterwards. I would like Thanks, to submit dude. a veto to that, that offer that request. You can't submit vetoes. Get out of here, Michael. <laughs> oh, we need uh, Michael AI and Pavu control. <laughs> I love this. I love this. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> okay, Neil. So, you know, the work of developers never ends even after a big release. So in lieu of that, what kind of help is needed right now for the Fedora project? I'm going to kind of put aside the whole like, you know, packaging and co- and writing code and stuff like that, because everybody always says that. And yes, hmm. we're a big project. That's always helpful and, and whatnot. But really, the things I want people to come and help documentation, testing, advocacy, and documentation. Documentation awesome. was twice I noticed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, it was. That's very important. <laughs> so thank you so much, Neil, for your contributions to Fedora and OpenSUSE and your participation in our community. Love. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a true open source warrior, and we look forward to having you back in, on the show again. We love having you, Neil. Yeah. You're an awesome part of the community, Neil. Yeah. I love being on this show. Thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me, you know, blather on about Fedora Linux 34. <laughs> it's been awesome. Anytime. Anytime. Yeah. <laughs> this episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. Bitwarden is a password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do that? Well, Bitwarden provides tools to store all of your passwords in a secured vault. It also gives you the ability to automatically generate those passwords for you and even automatically fill in those passwords on login forms so you don't have to do that either. And you have access across multiple different types of devices like web browser extensions, mobile apps, desktop applications, and even on the command line. As, and also Bitwarden seals and encrypts all this data uh, with end-to-end encryption before it ever leaves your devices so you know you're the only person with access to this data. And you can go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And I mentioned that you can start get started for free, but you can also get their premium account, which has a lot of extra features, and it starts at less than a dollar per month. That's right. For just $10 per year, you get one gigabyte encrupted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, priority customer service, and so much more. You get all this for less than a dollar per month. That's right. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN and check it out because for less than two cups of coffee, you can get a fantastic uh, password manager to be able to store all of your stuff. And, and, and in fact, I'm such a big fan of Bitwarden because one of the main reasons I'm such a fan is that it's open source software. That's right. 100% open source software is, is just, it's an amazing service. So check it out. Bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. Thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring Destination Linux. This is the section of the show where I'm going to tell you a story. A couple of episodes ago, we just dis- we, we discussed a rather important uh, topic on this show about backups, data recovery, and data loss prevention. If you missed that episode, be sure to check it out because there's a lot of valuable information in there. And if you're a longtime viewer of this show, you you may be aware that there's a running joke during our live streams about how much storage I have available prior to recording the show. And just or, a quick, or lack thereof. Just want to. Yeah. Well, okay, lack sure. Thereof. And just a quick <laughs> note for reference: each episode requires anywhere between three to ten gigabytes for the recordings. So you know, depending on how long those recordings are. Uh, so now back to the story. Uh, DL two twenty one inspired me to reassess my system and improve my structure in backups, data loss mm-hmm. prevention, and even data organization. Noah had a lot of great tips for organization, so I applied many of them in my system. And I can safely say that this new system is vastly superior to the system I had previously. And now mm-hmm. the episode itself was very valuable in many ways to me, but it wasn't necessarily the discussion that inspired me to make these changes because during the discussion, in fact, during my part of the discussion about backups and data loss prevention, I received a desktop notification from my system essentially screaming at me, I had 173 megabytes of space left on my machine (laughs) while being 35% into the show. 
So nice. uh, uh, that was a, a a big good job, Michael. Yeah, exactly. It was it was a nice. It's just it's just reminded me like it was great because it happened right when I was talking about not losing data. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I quickly adjusted and passed it back off to Noah and Ryan's like, oh, yeah, y- 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 y'all got this. Then I went and fixed it. And then after the show, I fixed my entire system. And now I have hundreds of gigabytes available. Until next week. Well, yes. Aww. And it's definitely a much better ex- uh, experience. So if you have any issues with data loss or needing to do backups and whatnot, you should check out episode 221 for sure. Aww. Michael, I'm so happy you talked about it because we had talked about it after the show. <laughs> so this reminds me, you know, we talk about this stuff every, you know, ever so often over the shows about backing up and the importance of it. But it reminds me of like uh, a lot of people were really jealous when I was growing up, like, man, your dad owns a computer business. How cool is it that you get to build computers and have all access to all these parts and computers? And it was it was super cool. But the uncool part is that sometimes that computer that I built and I loved and we had all around the house were all parted to build something else or repair something else that was for the business. So nothing was ever guaranteed that that new motherboard or GPU that I had this week was going to Mm -hmm. exist next week because dad needed it for a project or something at, at work. And it reminds me of like you, here we are, we talk about this stuff, we stick it, but you never have time to do it yourself. Uh, no. to, for the backup, but it's yeah. good that you finally put a plan in place. I, I never had time to do it until my yeah. computer was like, "You need to do something." Yeah. So, Aww. so I did. I did it after the show. Yeah. Up next in the show, we're going to talk about a application that I am a huge fan of, and that is Caden Live. So, Caden Live is an awesome open source video editor on Linux. It has a new release with version twenty one point zero four, and we're just going to talk about some of the features. There's a ton of really cool features, but we're going to talk about the highlights. So, first of all, we have the new speech to text feature, which allows you to automatically transcribe this any audio cool. to text with the Vosk speech recognition toolkit. And that is just fantastic. It mm-hmm. also works with uh, multiple languages, like seventeen different languages. It's really cool. Do you uh, know if if you use that, will YouTube's language translator automatically overwrite it or can you just uh it will it has an option to do both like so okay. like you can you i assume that you can take the, de- the the details from it and export it into a file and then upload that as a subtitles thing uh that's but it also right. okay. youtube will do its own as well so you can kind of compare the two as, at, at the same time so that's very cool. cool uh the media browser widget has been added to easily browse and add your clips to the project they have modified the online resources, so it's been converted into a widget, makes it easier to uh, get more resources from online. And they also added more media providers like uh, Pexel and Pixabay and stuff like that. They've actually done some stuff to the timeline as well. They've they've improved the timeline, the uh, like visual overhaul, making it better looking for the guides and markers and stuff like that. They've added Zoom bars, which is a lot uh, going to be nice for a lot of people to be able to. Those are delicious. Yeah. Sure. Oh, why not? Zoom bars. You can easily zoom in and out of the timeline by dragging oh. the edges of the timeline scroll bar, and also, I assume it's wrapped in chocolate. And uh, you you can. <laughs> There's also been improvements for shortcut and key binding information. So discoverability of key binding has improved because you can hover over an item in the t- in the UI, and at the bottom left of the status bar, it'll if if it has a shortcut, it will tell you what it is, which is very cool. Now those are some highlights, but there are two things that I. I, I geek squealed when I saw it in, in the notes. I can't be. Can we get a just... reenactment, please? Woo! Yeah. Okay. I, I think like I that. know which ones, Michael, because these are my favorite too. Ooh, let's do that. <laughs> Jill, guess which ones made Michael geek squeal? Uh, improved, the improved keyframe panel for effects. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> the keyframes are. Uh, the keyframes in in Caden Live were already powerful, but they added yeah. a couple of things that were just nice and a couple things that were mind blowingly awesome. Thank you so much. So mm-hmm. the ability to duplicate existing keyframes so that you can have you can just repeat the same thing you did, which is fantastic. But also this one it was <laughs> what? Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Being able to move multiple keyframes at once on the keyframe panel, which means that if you create yes. something and slightly modify the clip, previously you'd have to manually move those keyframes, but now you just go, oh, okay, I moved it, it's a little bit longer. Let's just move these things over here. Okay, good. Like yes. a two second change, like uh, <laughs> fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, the next thing that made me geek squeal was the effect zone. So what this is, is the, you previously could apply uh, effects 
and stuff like that to the clips in the timeline. Now, you can do it directly to the timeline itself and the track specifically. So you can make timeline regions or you can do it to the track it is on. And no matter what clip is in that track, the effect is applied. So yeah, that's pretty cool. you can do it in a big grander scale of the effect, which is just fantastic. This means you don't have to copy and paste the effects for each clip. You can just put it on the track and you're good to go. Like, Or specifically the region is the most powerful thing, the, the timeline region part. So good. Mm-hmm. So uh, Caden Live, every single time, <laughs> just gets better and better. And this one was like, yeah, I, 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 I admit I have geek swelled multiple times on Caden Live releases, but this one, this one was a big one. So yeah, thank you so good. much for de- all the developers at Caden Live. It's getting to the point so where I, I, I love Lightworks. I use Lightworks because that's really what I needed in the interim between Caden Live you know, and, and it's kind of build up of features and things, but it's getting to the point where honestly, for most of my video projects, I just open Caden Live um, and I use Lightworks less and less and less. And I think that's a testament to the amount of work that Caden Live has done in the years that I've been making videos um, before. Of course, you could always edit and do stuff, but there were stability issues and they've resolved that in, in big ways. Then it was really the speed of editing. Then it was the multiple camera support. Then it was... But they've slowly started filling in all of those gaps that they've had. And now we're getting to the point where this is a true, a really true competitor in, in the video editing world um, mm-hmm. that I think people yeah. need to check out again if you've left it because maybe mm-hmm. you were one of those people editing a project and your video crashed years ago. And, you know, because Caden Live had some stability issues. Uh, that stuff has not happened to me in, in forever. I can't remember the last time it's happened. It's just been very, very stable. And a lot of the features they're adding are nice advanced features that um, if you're not doing professional movie production, Caden Live can do most of your video editing needs and it's free and open source. So Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of that, uh, Ryan, this brings each of these releases is bringing Caden Live closer to the Adobe premieres, the final yep. cuts, the DaVinci resolves of the world and after effects as well. So, um, and that keyframe panel, all those little changes, those are all the things, a lot of the things that annoyed me and now they're being fixed and they're drawing attention to them and, and implementing them, (laughs) which makes me excited. Yeah. The effects, but the the keyframe thing was like, oh, it's really cool that you can customize (laughs) these keyframes. But the problem with it was that it would make it difficult to, you know, once you create that keyframe, to then reuse it or to apply exactly. it to a different section of that time of that clip. And yeah. it was just because you each individual keyframe was kind of independent and you couldn't do these manipulations and stuff. And it just <laughs> it was still fantastic and good, but it didn't have that polish of easy and quick. Right. Like a professional <laughs> editor usually has these, you know, these nice little polish things. And to when they announced this, like <gasps> like they actually yeah. buried it in the bottom <laughs> of the uh, the notes. <laughs> so, and I scrolled down. I was like, keyframe duplication, <gasps> moving selected keyframes. I love this. So yeah. that was, that's <laughs> another reenactment. That's that's kind of how it was. Yeah, that was good. Well done. The, the other cool thing in Caden Live, they are working on GPU acceleration. So it is coming. Mm. It yeah. is coming. <laughs> Can't wait that's for that too. Probably the last big thing I've been waiting on is the GPU yeah. acceleration. <laughs> that's going to be huge. Well, you know what else is huge? Tax season is huge here <laughs> yeah, in the United States. What a segue. <laughs> what a segue. Uh, 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 it's tax season here, which every self-employed person loves. I know Michael and I have spent endless amount of time recently dealing with taxes for Destination Linux, for instance, Fun and times. our own home, our own channels and the other businesses and things that we do along with getting taxed and everything. Uh, it's just a big thing here in the US. You just get taxed and then tax some more and tax some more and well, that's why this game really caught my attention. It's called Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion, which that's really, like, yeah, sure. seemed like an exciting thing to do during this season. Represents our dislike of Uncle Sam and some of his policies in such an amazing way. It has 671 overwhelmingly positive reviews. So a lot of people feeling the Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion game here. I'm you really play surprised in a- that it's got that many reviews. <laughs> For such a ridiculous it, name of a game. It's based on me because you play as an adorable, uh, yet troublemaking what may is not based on me turn up because I don't think oh. I'm a turn up. So I think, I think Ryan is now the adorable he's a turn up somehow. All right, yeah. cool. <laughs> Avoid paying taxes. Solve plantastic puzzles. You'd like that dad 
Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Harvest crops and battle massive beasts all in a journey to tear down a corrupt vegetable government. <laughs> That's a ridiculous. A thrilling single player adventure full of tax evasion, petty crimes, and more. I mean, it just speaks to me. Dungeons full of puzzles, enemies, and rare treasures to pay back your debt. Battle massive beasts to terrorize the garden community. Grow and harvest plants to aid in your journey. Large <laughs> cast of corky characters it goes on multiple endings all of this stuff it just looks like a super fun game to check out and for those in the u.s uh very timely as well and yeah. you can run it natively right there in linux nice i do like the fact that it's linux native but that is awesome and i yeah. um this is, when you first put this in here and you say we're going to talk about really we're going to talk about a what, what is it called again <laughs> uh turnip boy commits yeah, tax evasion <laughs> <Turnip boy. laughs> like, well, okay, sure, but I, I looked at the videos like, okay, it kind of looks fun. Okay, I, I yeah. might I might give it a chance, but yeah, yeah. No, th this game is a lot of fun. I started playing it. Oh, nice! I've played it over an hour, <laughs> and nice. I love all the. It has lots of little Easter eggs, like geeky Easter eggs. <laughs> and it's just now, fun. Jill. They say video games can change your real behavior. Have you thought about tax evasion? <laughs> <since playing No. laughs> Not at all. Okay, Absolutely just check. Yeah. That's a good answer for the IRS. <laughs> no, but you know what's fun about this game? I kind of, <laughs> I was when I was playing through it. I'm like, this is so cool. It's 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 actually got a beautiful graphic style as well. It's it's very kawaii hipster pixel yeah. of a turn up <laughs> menace. <laughs> yeah, kind of reminds me of like a like a Pokemon style sort of in a way. Yeah, it, and and the play is very Zelda like. So if you like Zelda, mm. you will like like Fantastic. this game. <laughs> very cool. It's an ocarina about time. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. Anyway, let's move on to the spotlight because we have a really interesting spotlight that was sent in to us uh, by a community member, Michael. So hi, DL. I have a s software suggestion for you, albeit without standard packaging. I store all of my music in FLAC format on my NAS. As FLAC is not always usable on standard Androids used by the kids, I wanted to batch convert all FLACs to MP3s. A seemingly simple issue, but I lost a lot of time on half-baked solutions. Some Google hits suggested basic bash scripts, and others did seem to work fine, but they threw all metadata overboard, tags, album art, that sort of stuff in the process. And finally, I found a working tool, Smart Music Sync. It's a GitLab link. We'll have it in the show notes. It uses a simple YAML, of course, config file in the current directory to instruct the con conversion process. And best of all, it keeps the metadata during the conversion. Nice. Under the hood, it uses the trustworthy FFmpeg. Fantastic. The installation is manual, but well documented. I run it on a Raspberry Pi 4 running Diet Pi, and everything is converted yeah. correctly using all four cores. Subsequent runs detect all new flax and convert them incrementally based on the file timestamps. That is really cool, too. And they say that it's a pity this tool is ranked so low on search engines. Anyway, though, thanks for the show. Uh, Michael from Belgium. Thank you well, so much, Michael. We're about to fix that search engine Aww. problem, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to try. We're, we're doing our best for that one. So thanks so much for sending that in, that pick in, Michael. Awesome. Thanks. It sounds like an awesome tool. Uh, yeah. Hopefully they will be start patching, packing it shit. I think the, the problem that people might not be using is because there's no packages on the distros except for Arch. I think there's an AUR package. But like there, I would be really excited to see maybe like a flat pack for this application. That would increase the, you know, the, the search engine ranking and stuff like that tremendously. So hopefully they consider that. But thank you for so much for the tip. Mm -hmm. With the new Caden Live, Caden Live release, we thought it would be fun to do some Caden Live tips and tricks. So here's the deal: like Ryan, I, I in fact, Ryan, was it my suggestion that got you on Lightworks to begin yeah, with? Totally. Yep. So it was I, a great I, I one also, during that time. It was, and it was one of the only professional tools out there on Linux that could actually get the job done. But like you said, like you alluded to earlier, these days that's not the case. In fact, I don't actually have Lightworks installed on my machine right now. I haven't had it since. Well, probably since I installed 2004. Um, and part of that is because Caden Live has gotten so good. Um, and so one of the things that Caden Live has done really well that I thought was really interesting is they've really kind of taken on the same sort of workflow and layout that Adobe Premiere has. And how I found that was we actually we hired a guy at Altispeed to do some promotional stuff for us and sat him down at the workstation and said, here's our video editing workstation. He looks at it and he goes, oh, I, oh, this isn't a Premiere. And then he looks at it for a little bit and goes, oh, but it works basically like Premiere. And I, we, I was kind of having a conversation with him. And I said, so 
you've done a lot of editing and pre premiere. And he goes, yeah, it's almost exclusively what I've used. And I said, what do you think of this? And he goes, oh, this is great. I'm, all the key cut shortcuts work and everything kind of feels this, the, the same layout as I had on premiere. And so he did a couple of projects on there. And, um, and, and so for a guy that, that worked natively in premiere, it was no problem to transition into Caden live. And that was, that was, I guess, kind of my, my confirmation that I'm not just living in an echo chamber. I'm not just living <laughs> inside of a bubble that tells me like, oh, I'll just use the tool that I want to use. No, even people who don't have unnecessarily a commitment to free and open source or the best editor on Linux, look at it and go, yeah, this works like every other Linux video editor. So to get started, here are some of my favorite commands that you can use um, to make your video editing a little easier. To ungroup clips, you can use control plus shift plus G. To go to the project end, control plus N. To go to the start of the project, control mm -hmm. plus home. To toggle full screen mode on and off, control shift and F for full screen. And to make a cut, make sure the track is selected first and then press shift plus R. Michael, you're a guru of Caden Live. Give us some of your great tips. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have I didn't have free storage space. <laughs> yeah, have storage. Have storage yes. space. I have a yeah. bunch of tips, and I just I don't want to you know we don't want to ex be excessive. I understand because I I have a tendency to go you on. You get forever. one, uh, one, 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 Michael. Okay, okay. Um, maybe two, but one. Maybe two. Okay, so let's go with first of all the ability to do is there's a shortcut that I really love that is able to jump between the end and the points of different clips. So let's say you have 15 clips on your timeline. You are at the beginning of that clip. You can hit home to be on that, that clip at the very beginning of it. But alt left and right allows you to jump from endpoints of each clip. So you can really quickly go from clip to clip to clip to clip. And it doesn't matter if there's any space that in between cool. or anything like that. And another really awesome thing is that if you start using the guides inside of Caden Live, you can use that alt left and right to jump between the clips and between the guides, and it makes it much faster to do some editing. So the, that's a, a a quick tip. I have plenty more, but we'll, uh, as Ryan limited me, I'll just, I'll just stop there. <laughs> do you see him fold his arms? He's throwing a fit. Fine, I'll only do one. We'll, we'll have more yeah. in the next show. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, there you go. Well, a big thank you to each and every one of you for watching, listening. However you partake of Destination Linux, we love your faces. We also love all the faces of our amazing patrons and sponsors, supporters here with us right now in our 68,000, it grew, square foot virtual stadium right. <laughs> where they get behind the scenes access in the patron only after show each and every single week, get to come hang out with the crew VIP access, extended discussions, make fun of Michael. All of those things what? are a possibility to you if you are a patron or sponsor supporter yeah. of this show. And you can find out more information on that by going to destinationlinux.network. Yeah, and also like the the recording stadium. In fact, when you become a patron of of the the, the podcast, you not only get to go into the stadium, you get to go into the skybox. Yeah, I was just gonna, gonna say right. we call it the skybox. Oh, did we right? open the skybox? I thought it was still under construction. <laughs> oh, but, I, I think it's I think it's safe to open it now. I'm finished. I'm okay. Safe. Awesome. Yeah. In addition, every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we're now live on DLNlive.com. The best part, everyone is invited to watch the recording of Destination Linux each and every week. We can't wait to see you in the chat. And also go right now to dealinstore.com to check out all the great swag that we have. We got t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, stickers, hats, even got oh aprons now. And we're going to have some like, I don't know, backpacks. Who knows? All kinds of stuff coming to the DealIn store. Check it out. So much <laughs> great stuff. Dealinstore.com. And also you can check out all the cool stuff that Jill has. She's got the camper <laughs> mug and she's got Yay. the new shirt that I don't even have yet. I need to get that. Uh, <laughs> I like that color too, Jill. Yeah, awesome. this is the dark pink. I have yeah. a light pink one, but this is the dark. That's cool. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so check it out, dealinstore.com. And we have so many amazing shows here on the Destination Linux Network. We have the Pseudo Show, the Ask Noah Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel. There he goes dabbing. <laughs> we have DLN Extend, <laughs> Hardware Addicts, and Get Your Game On with our latest show, GameSphere. So go to destinationlinux.network and subscribe to all these shows to keep those penguins marching in the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. And Michael, you did do a good job last week. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I heard that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, and also uh, just letting you, you know that DLN Extend will be doing a live show on May 19th. So uh, make sure to mark that date. Don't and miss join that. In. So everybody have a great week.
And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> See you next week.